You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 103, Moses and the Bronze Serpent. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hi, Mike. How are you doing this week? Pretty good. Pretty good. Well, good, good. It's been a long week, so. <laughs> yeah, it, it has. I I did some uh, filming last week, uh, so that was fun. I uh, did a few Skywatch episodes to promote Unseen Realm and, and uh, a book that I've alluded to that I'm working on. So it was, it was busy, but it was kind of nice to get away and do a little bit of that. And, you know, people on that end appreciate the podcast. Okay, good. I really enjoyed the last two episodes with the eschatology. So yeah, I'm here for no more. But... <laughs> well, I didn't get any hate mail. <laughs> no, we got lots of positive feedback in the last two episodes. Yeah. yeah no one uh, emailed me to remind me that I was giving up the faith or anything like that. So yeah. <laughs> You never know. I never know what to expect when I do prophecy because people just, they just kind of crazy with it. Yeah. yeah they're passionate about it. Yeah. So it's the end times, Mike. It's the end of the world. Right. Right. It matters. It's the end of the world. It, it's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, if the Cubs get in the World Series, I'll pay more attention, you know, because that's, like I said, that's the harbinger of the end right there. Yeah, sounds good. Well, we're in numbers 21. Um, by request, you know, who who would have ever thought that uh, people would ask for a podcast episode in the book of Numbers? Well, here we are. Uh, that, that is the chapter, Numbers 21, first nine verses of the Moses and the serpent in the wilderness of the bronze serpent episode. And and I've, we're doing this because I was asked by two or three people uh, recently, and, and I've had people ask about this in email on, you know, other occasions. So I figured, hey, why not? You know, this is, it's, it's a good for good kind of a episode for a topical episode. So why not? Now, in these verses, I'm going to start off, we're going to read the passage. But the first thing we're going to do is sort of talk about why people kind of wonder about this passage. And it's a little, it's a little bit off the beaten path. Uh, we're, we're actually going to get into authorship issues here. But it's actually important because uh, I, I think the episode uh, in the book of Numbers here, needs to be framed in a certain a certain way. And if you frame it in a certain way, it, it might sort of relieve some of the tension uh, about uh, the content of the passage and, and why it's sort of controversial and why people wonder about it. But here's the passage. Let's just start in verse 1 here. I'm reading ESV. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, He fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. And this is related to Harem. This destruction context is a little bit different. It's sort of retaliatory. But again, the same word that we've often talked about here in the podcast and in Unseen Realm. Verse 4 continues, From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that the many so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So that's the the story. It's a short episode. But again, one of the reasons why people kind of wonder about it is the way this gets referenced in the New Testament with Jesus about the Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and so on and so forth. So... 
that creates kind of a conundrum in, in the minds of a number of people. Well, just to start off here, I think we need to think about our own preconceptions here and kind of you know examine a little bit why this particular episode kind of gets the attention it does. And as I just noted, a lot of Christians find the passage confusing, maybe even troubling, not only because Jesus references uh, this episode and they wonder what in the world's going on with that. You know, why would you know why would he reference that? And you ask, well, what, what's the harm in referencing it? Well, that brings us to to the second reason why people again kind of get freaked out about it. It's because there's a serpent involved. So there's really two reasons why people find the the, the passage confusing or troubling. And that is, it involves a serpent, and the noun nakash is used, okay, which is the, 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 the term used for the serpent enemy, the enemy of God in Genesis 3. So this noun is used in Numbers 21, verses 6, 7, and 9. There's another word also used, saraf, uh, in, in, the, in the chapter, Numbers 21, 6, and 8. But we have this reference to the nakash in this passage. So Moses is going to build a bronze nakash. And also, when Jesus does reference this passage, you know, that about the Son of Man being lifted up just like the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up, it just feels kind of weird that Jesus would use as an analogy to his impending crucifixion an episode that involved nakash, okay, this, this term, you know, the, the serpent. Again, because it's a term that goes back to the Garden of Eden story, Genesis 3, the, you know, the great enemy, the, the, the Nakash that will be later called the devil and, and Satan. So we look at, at sort of this agglomeration of ideas, Nakash, serpent, devil, Satan, Moses, wilderness, you know, bronze serpent, Jesus, crucifixion, son of man being lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up. And it, it looks really confusing because, precisely because, all of these ideas are floating around in our head. But that's the point. These ideas are floating around in our head. The Israelites experiencing this event in real time know nothing about Jesus. They know nothing about the cross. They don't even know, and this is going to sound controversial, I would suggest to you they don't even know the story of the Garden of Eden. We assume they do, because we do. And we assume that, that there's this confusion here in the in the Bible, quote unquote, in the Bible, because we have the whole Bible and we have all of these things and we, we sort of blend them all together. You know, they, they, they go in the same file drawer in our heads and we, we read the, the numbers passage and, or, or Jesus' you know, statement about the numbers passage and we immediately bring the serpent enemy from Genesis 3 into the discussion. Okay, there is nothing in any of these texts that references Genesis 3 specifically. And again, I'm going to repeat my own you know, position here, my own thinking to start off with. I don't think, I think there's a very good chance that no, no Israelite, none of the Israelites had even heard of the serpent story in the Garden of Eden okay, when, when this event is happening in real time. Now, that, that's going to take some unwrapping because I know that in and of itself sounds a little odd. But I'm suggesting to you, and I want you to start thinking about this, that it sounds odd because you have an entire Bible. You cannot assume that an Israelite had the entire Bible. And frankly, you can't even assume that the Israelites living in Moses' day had any Bible at all. So this confusion that, that, that is in our heads about this passage and about the Garden of Eden story and about Jesus' reference to this is a manufactured confusion. Because in our heads, all of those things are circulating, when in the text, none of those things get linked to each other specifically. The only link that you have is Jesus saying, hey, you know, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up. He has no reference back. He's not talking about Satan. He's not talking about Genesis 3. He's talking about Numbers 21. And Numbers 21 is not talking about Genesis 3. And in real time, Again, the, the people living Numbers 21, the people who are getting bitten by the serpents and Moses do something before we die, and they're, you know, Moses you know, creates the bronze serpent, they look at it and they live. None of those people were thinking you know, about the Garden of Eden either because they didn't have the story. And chances are they'd never even heard of the story. Now, let, let's unpack that a little bit. You basically have, I mean, this, this gets us into this whole mosaic authorship 
uh, issue, at least peripherally, at least a little bit. But this topic or passage, again, invariably takes us in, takes us that direction because, again, we have the whole Bible. And so we're, we're naturally thinking that everybody else does too, or did. When it comes to the issue of Genesis 3, did they know about that? You basically got two options. I mean, I'm going I'm to exclude higher critical schools here, JEDP, you know, kind of stuff, you know, because, it, you know, it, it's speculative, you know, on, about sources that existed and how sources were mixed and matched and when they were written, all that kind of stuff. You know, again, excluding that, if you're sort of a, a, a person with a high view of Scripture, you basically got two options. One is that Moses wrote Genesis 3. Okay, you, you accept that out of the gate. That, 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 that's your starting point. Moses wrote Genesis 3. Hey, Moses is, the, is the, the guy in the story of Numbers 21. And so, again, mentally, you assume, you assume, again, without any actual data, that Moses, I mean, this is going to sound comical, that Moses had written Genesis 3 and that everybody there had read it. Okay, now, aside from the, the, the point of, of that being logistically impossible, how would Moses write this? Here we have one copy of it now. I wrote the story, Genesis 3. And now, if you take the low estimate of the numbers, if you don't take the numbers literally, okay, for the, the wandering Israelites, if you got a few hundred thousand of them, what are they doing? Passing a, passing a stone tablet around? Are they passing, you know, the, the, the text written on a, an animal skin? Are they passing it around? Again, it's absurd to think that even if Moses wrote it right there, right before the event in real time, that any, anybody knew it, can you have to make amazing logical leaps to get to that that position, that idea. Uh, if it's a few million people, well, then it, it, the problem becomes even more absurd. Okay, you, I, I'm hoping you get the picture. So even if you think Moses wrote Genesis 3, and this is the standard view, you have problems. But let, let's think a little bit more about, the, the again, the standard conservative view here. Standard conservative view, again, would, would say, okay, we got Moses wrote the Torah, which of course includes Genesis. And when did Moses write that? Oh, probably, again, if you read, you know, again, conservative books about this, Moses would have been writing the content of the Torah and Genesis, at least the stuff that wasn't the law and the, and the legal stuff, during the wilderness wanderings. And he probably wrote the law when they're at Sinai, but now here we are wandering around the desert. So Moses has lots of time. I don't know how he has lots of time while he's walking around for miles, but we'll just say, okay, he has lots of time to write. Maybe he's doing it at night. You know, he has his day job leading the people through the wilderness, and his night job is writing the Torah, whatever. Okay, but he has lots of time to write, so he's writing, again, during the wilderness wanderings. So the standard view also, again, if you think about it, actually has to argue that God kind of mentally downloaded the content of Genesis 1 through 11 into Moses' head. In other words, Moses couldn't write Genesis 1 through 11 by experience or by the, the, the traditions of his own people, because this is all primeval history. And again, this is standard. This is the standard conservative view, be, the, the, that part of the doctrine of inspiration would allow them, at least the way they understand it, allow them to say, well, when Moses was writing the Torah, again, a lot of that stuff, you know, from Genesis 12 on, you know, you've got family history, the history of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and, and they're the descendants of Jacob, okay, you know, going down to Egypt, they're the, the, the 12 tribes and all that stuff. And, and so you're, you're getting into, you know, contemporary material for them. But, but the Genesis 1 to 11 stuff, the stuff before Abraham, there, there's no sense that anybody has any record of that. So God has to give it directly. And he gives it directly to Moses, and Moses carefully writes it down. Okay, again, this is the standard view of how we get Genesis 1 through 11 in terms of a total commitment to Mosaic authorship. Uh, again, part of the standard sort of traditional conservative model. So Moses gets this information, didn't know it himself. God has to provide it. Again, Genesis 12 through 50 is a little different because Moses could could get this information from his ancestors or his ancestors' ancestors. A lot again, the standard conservative view is that the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were orally transmitted by by the family, you know, by the the, the members of the Israelite nation, because this was their family history. They they tell it to each other, they pass it down from generation to generation. 
the stories of, of, you know, how Abraham was called and what happened to him and Isaac and Rebecca and then Jacob and the 12 tribes and Joseph's trip to Egypt. This is all something they knew by oral transmission. And in Moses' day, Moses codifies it. He writes it down. Again, it's very possible. And this is how oral traditions, oral, oral cultures work. Oral transmission is done with a high degree of accuracy, and then eventually it gets written down. For for those of those of you who are over forty, maybe over fifty, uh, you, you know, this this takes your mind back maybe to the scene in Roots, you know, when that was big on TV, because that's how the author Alex Haley, you know, finds his relationship to Kunta Kinte because he goes to Africa and he sits there and he, he you know for days listening to this guy recite the oral family history and then he finally comes to to Kinta's name and says hey i found you you know okay that kind of thing that that's real okay when it comes to oral cultures that is how it's done and it's done with an amazing amount of accuracy because that's all they have they don't have tv they don't have books they, it's an oral culture so they they put their mental energy you know, there there are select people who do this to memorizing the entire history of the clan and and so again, this is something well known uh, anthropologically speaking from all over the world, and, and the Israelites, you know, don't have to be any exception here. So again, the standard conservative view is that this is how Moses, when he sat down to write, got the information about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He he had someone transmit it to him orally. He writes it down. Genesis one to eleven though has to sort of drop from heaven because that that isn't again part of the family history. That's something that God has to tell Moses, and then. After you get to the end of Genesis, where are you at? You're in Moses' own day, Exodus 1. There arose a Pharaoh in the land who didn't know Joseph, and then we get into the history of Moses. So Moses can write that stuff, and then you get the law, you get the story of the Exodus. Moses is there for all this. And he's there for the giving of the law. He's there you know, for the, the wilderness wanderings and all this stuff. And so everything else in, in the Torah, again, in the standard conservative view, is, is easy to, to attribute to Moses until you get to Deuteronomy 34 when he dies. You know, did Moses write the account of his own death, you know, all that kind of stuff. So this is, again, a very typical way of looking at Mosaic authorship of the Torah. And so when it comes to Genesis 3, those who believe Moses wrote that would say that God gave him that story, gave him that information, and he wrote it at some point during the wilderness wanderings. Well, all of that means, again, all of that leaves you, I should say, all of that leaves you with the realization that we don't really have any actual evidence that the Israelites living the events of Numbers 21 would ever have heard the story of Adam and Eve, again, be, before they're, they're getting bitten by these fiery ser- serpents, again, to make some sort of association. Uh, again, an association that we make because, you know, we read Genesis 3 before we hit Numbers 21. And these two things just sort of glom onto each other in our heads. Well, the Israelites, that's not happening because you you don't know when Moses wrote it. You can't say there's nothing in the Bible that points the, to, to the idea that Moses had already composed Genesis 3 and then this incident in Numbers 21 happened. We have no idea. Okay, there's, there's actually nothing to hang this hat on. It's all entirely unknowable. And so the, you know, the odds are, are just as good that the Israelites would have never read Genesis 3, and the account didn't even exist for them to read. And even if it did exist, are they passing it around to all few hundred thousand or few million people? Again, it, it's just kind of ridiculous to assume that they knew this story of the, of the Nakash in Genesis 3. Now, of course, you know, once it does get written down, and, and again, you know, depending on when you think that is, then it's, that's going to be part of of what the how the Israelites you know think about not only their own history but the history of everything, the history of the whole world and the human condition and all that, just like we do. You know, they're they're going to have that material to to read and reflect on. Now, the second view, other than Moses wrote Genesis three, is surprise, surprise, Moses didn't write Genesis three. Uh, and I actually think this one makes more sense. This is actually my preference, and that is you know this view, and I've expressed this view b- before on the podcast that Genesis one through eleven was written later than Moses' lifetime. I personally think Genesis 1 through 11 was written during the exile in Babylon, since A, there are many specific textual, philological, that's linguistic kind of stuff, philological connections, very specific connections to Babylonian or Mesopotamian literature in general in these 11 chapters. And secondarily, B, that was A, this is B. The, my, my other reason for thinking that it was written during the exile is that there are very few 
specific Egyptian connections in Genesis 1 through 11, which you would sort of expect if you if it was composed in the immediate Mosaic era. Uh, again, in, instead, of, instead of Genesis 1 through 11 taking shots at the Mesopotamian gods and the Babylonian stories, you would expect it to be taking shots at the gods of Egypt because, hey, we just, we just left Egypt. God picked on them and beat up on them, and we had the exodus, and here we are at Sinai, you know, all that kind of thing. But you don't get that. You get a very, very distinct Mesopotamian flavor to Genesis 1 through 11. And so that's where the Israelites are in exile. They are in Babylon. And a lot of the material in Genesis 1 through 11 is specifically dissing Babylonian religion, Babylonian deities, all this sort of stuff. It's it's to blacken their eye, so to speak. And and you don't really get really there, there's very little uh, that that could be sort of tied into Egyptian material in Genesis one through eleven. So that's why I think it makes more sense to have Genesis one through eleven written later than the Mosaic era, again by someone else in the believing community that God chose to to write that chose to, in my view, actually chose to append it to material that, that begins with the family history of Israel, Genesis 12 onward, which, you know, again, I don't have any trouble assuming that you could have had uh, mosaic authorship a lot, of a lot of that, a mosaic hand you know, directly involved in that. Who knows? I mean, ultimately, we, we don't know. But what I'm talking about here is Genesis 1 through 11. I'm not in the JEDP camp, and I'm not in the, the traditional conservative camp either, because frankly, I I think both views have points that just don't make much sense. One other comment, uh, just by way of illustration, you say, well, Babylonian flavor to Genesis 1 to 11, what are you talking about, Mike? Okay. Genesis 1, there are specific points of contact to Enuma Elish, you know, the, the story of Marduk's elevation to supremacy. Marduk was the chief deity during the Babylonian era, 6th century BC, lo and behold, that's the time of the exile. And when I say specific connections, I mean, there are places in Genesis where the Hebrew of Genesis mimes or mimics the syntax of Enuma Elish, specifically in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, by the way, you have that happen. So there's even grammatical congruence in the way the writer wrote. Where's the position of the verb? Where's the position of the conjunction? Where's the position of the noun? It, 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 it mimes certain lines in Enuma Elish. And again, to a literate reader, someone who knew both texts, the reason for doing that would have been very evident and would have been, would have been very obvious as well, that, that the writer of Genesis wants you to think of the Babylonian story because he's going to poke, poke it in the eye. He's going to diss it. He's going to turn it on its head and make a different theological point. Well, you need the text of Enuma Elish to do that. So is Moses like carrying one around in the desert? He couldn't in this case because it hadn't been written yet. The one Enuma Elish, the elevation of Marduk, was written in the sixth century. This is, you know, centuries after Moses lived and died. So it's it's a clear point of incongruence. Another example, Genesis two and three. Garden of Eden story. Again, the you know, they have the, the, the serpent story in the garden. There are some clear similarities between that material and Gilgamesh. Another one called Adapa, a text called Adapa in the South Wind. Genesis 5, again, the list of genealogies, scholars have, have known for a couple centuries since, that was, since the Sumerian king list was discovered, that the list of kings in the Sumerian king list, pre and post flood, that there's a relationship between the, 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 the list of names and the events in Genesis 5. Again, you, there, there are just connections there. So again, for, for that to make any sense, the writer would have to be doing something deliberate with that text with that Sumerian text. Genesis 6, 1 through 4, we've talked about this before in Unseen Realm and on the podcast, the story of the Apkalu, okay, drawn directly from Mesopotamian material. Genesis 6 through 9, the flood story. You have par- parallels in the Eridu Genesis, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Atrahasis Epic, again, down even to you know, the, the, the birds that get let go and do they come back and the building of an ark and the animals, the whole thing. Okay, you know, it has differences. Again, there are differences in the accounts, differences in the story and the way they're told, but there's a lot of specific connections. And again, if anybody who's taken sort of a Bible class, even in high school, really, but in, in college, this is the kind of thing that 
professors love to harp on because then they're going to say something stupid like, you know, the Israelites were copying. Israel, Israel alone, you know, had people so stupid they couldn't have an independent thought. You know, they, they just go the other way with it. They don't really think about what's happening in the text because, frankly, they're, they're not biblical scholars. But anyway. You know, they're they're usually religion scholars or something like that, or just somebody they stuck in a humanities class to destroy somebody's faith. You know, that's just the way it goes. Genesis ten through eleven, Babylonian map of the world. Okay, well that what's Genesis ten? The table of the nations. Okay, what the table of the nations shows is that again, Israel's not included in that table, but it has the same orientation. Again, the the eastern Medi- well, the whole Mediterranean, but largely the eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East. Babylonian map of the world has some congruences there. Uh, you have the stories of Nimrod. The closest candidates to identifying Nimrod are, guess what? They come from Assyrian material. That's Mesopotamian material. And you have a reference to a ziggurat, the Tower of Babel. It's Mesopotamian. Genesis 1 through 11 is littered with Mesopotamian elements. Okay, And so I doubt that Moses was hauling a library of cuneiform tablets around with him in the desert while delivering Israel in the exodus from Egypt. Now, yeah, Moses maybe could have read Akkadian. Akkadian was the language of the day, kind of like English is. It was the language of correspondence. The best evidence for this is actually evidence that aligns with the late date for the exodus, which a lot of, again, conservative Bible believers don't like because they, they want to go with the early date chronologically. But regardless, uh, you know, Akkadian was the language of international correspondence. If Moses is raised in the household of Egypt and he's going to be somebody important, okay, he, he may have learned Akkadian, at least enough to, you know, read a letter or whatever, you know, so that he knows what's going on in certain parts of the empire. Okay, I, I, I get that. But some of these things that I've just mentioned in this list were not composed. Okay, were not composed during the New Kingdom period, during that same time period. They were composed later. And so, again, it just doesn't make sense. To, uh, to to argue you know for mosaic authorship of these things, and again the, to me the biggest argument is that Genesis one through eleven the connections that are there are polemic, and again you would expect if Moses was writing it in an Egyptian context their deliverance from Egypt that you, he'd, he'd be dissing the Egyptian gods but that isn't what happens that ha- happens like in Exodus fifteen, okay it happens in Exodus twelve this night I will have I will have victory over the gods of Egypt all that kind of stuff happens with the plagues. But it doesn't happen in Genesis 1 through 11 is this the point we're making. So what's the point of, of this whole discussion? You know, what, what about the, the story? Again, what I'm saying is that in either view, either view, whether you think Moses wrote Genesis 3 or you think Moses didn't write Genesis 3, either view, it's really, really, really difficult, nigh unto impossible. I, I would frankly say it, it is impossible because you have to be omniscient to establish the notion that the Israelites who are experiencing the Numbers 21 episode being bitten by the serpents, that they had ever heard of the Genesis 3 story. Okay, my money is on, they never heard it at all. Which, again, in part explains why there are no specific connections between this story and Genesis 3 other than the term Nakash. Well, Nakash just means, you know, serpent when it's used as a noun, and very clearly it is here. We don't have a talking serpent. Okay, we don't have any indication in Numbers 21 that we're dealing with a divine being. People are getting bitten by serpents, okay, by snakes out in the desert. That's where lots of snakes live. And the thing that Moses is asked to fashion is very clearly a serpent on a pole. Okay, not a divine being. It's just a serpent. It's all it is. So in our head, reading Numbers 21 makes us think of Genesis 3, and then we go, oh, this is kind of a spooky passage. You know, what, does it have anything to do with Genesis? And Israelites never even ask that question. Just, just, it's not even on the radar. So that's the first thing you know we need to to sort of get straight in our heads. And I think that the point of the story, if you're able to do that, the actual story itself is is pretty self-explanatory. You know, I hate to be a downer here, but it kind of means exactly what it says. Now, there are a few things maybe lurking in the background. We'll talk about uh, over the next few minutes, but there's there's no mystical, mysterious, cryptic connection between Numbers 21 and Genesis 3. And therefore, since that's, that's the case, when Jesus uses Numbers 21 for an analogy about the crucifixion, again, he's not taking some mystical swipe at the devil or, or, or something weird going on. Again, that's just a product of our imagination. It is not a product of the text. Now, let's go to Numbers 21, spend the rest of our time actually in you know, the actual story. So, again, I, th- I think 
you know, we, we could start around, let's just go to verse four, you know, from Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and the people become impatient on the way they start griping. And then I think a key line here, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Uh, you know, anytime you speak against God, it, it's probably going to draw a reaction. And in this case, it does. Sometimes it's compassionate. Sometimes it's judgment. Here we got a case of judgment. You know, they ask, you know, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? Now, commentators have noticed that the way this this is worded uh, in Hebrew, but and you can you can sort of get it in English as well. It's very close to the Dathan and Abiram uh, language. You know, the, the language of complaining back in Numbers sixteen, and again that. That would sort of connect the two episodes being another one of these uh, you know, episodes where the people are – they're not only like grumpy and impatient, but they're, they're of the mind that, oh, we, we, we had it better back in Egypt, you know, which of course by implication is you're not – you're in slavery and then the gods of Egypt are your superiors, that kind of thing. And, and that's offensive. So that's going to draw a, a reaction you know, from God. It's, it's not only a rejection of, of him. It's, it's not only a rejection of, of the events that have preceded, like the crossing of the Red Sea. It's also very clearly a rejection of the provision of the manna, you know, where the people say, we hate this, word, we loathe this worthless food, you know, the, the stuff that God has been giving them. They don't like it. They, they, they grumble about that. So in response to, again, hearts that are hardening, to borrow again another Exodus metaphor here, in response to the Israelite grumbling and unbelief, Yahweh sent Ha Nekashim, Ha Seraphim. Okay, you have both terms, both plural, used side by side. So we have typical translation is fiery serpents. Okay, Ha Nekashim, Ha Seraphim. So fiery servants, serpents. You know that's a that's a, an okay translation. Again, I don't think there's there's anything really terribly weird again going on. Uh, I think the fiery uh, part again, would refer to the burning, metaphorically, of the venom, because they're getting bitten by snakes. I don't think we have anything strange here, like, you know, it's because the seraphim in, in uh, you know, in Isaiah 6, they were divine beings. Oh, well, now here we have, like, divine beings that are serpent people, or dragons, or fang demons, or, no, it, they're just snakes, okay? And this language, again, is used elsewhere of just snakes that when they bite you, it burns because they're venomous. It's really all it means. Now, in regard to this, though, there are some people who would, would try to, to make it more than that, not only on the basis of the seraphim, but just the term, but they would look back at Isaiah 6 and say, well, the seraphim had wings and they're flying around. And, you know, now back back in Moses' day, snakes must have been able to fly if they're just snakes. And, and then they'll point to Isaiah. There's two passages in, in Isaiah that marry these terms, the nekashim and the seraphim, to uh, another term, meofeif, which means flying. Okay, so Isaiah fourteen twenty nine, just to quote it for you in the ESV: Rejoice not, O Philistia, all of you, and the rod that struck you is broken. For the serpent's root shall come from the serpent's root shall come forth an adder, and its fruit will be a flying, fiery serpent. And then Isaiah thirty verse six has similar language. An oracle on the beasts of the Negev through a land of trouble and anguish. When there come the lioness and the lion, the adder and the flying fiery serpent, blah, 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 blah. Again, all the other animals in that list are normal, by the way. But the argument goes that we have we have a dragon here. We got something weird going on. Again, the, the terminology, and, and I've referenced this article before, and, and if you have Unseen Realm and you're reading the little section where I talk about the seraphim, you're going to get this article. But there's a really nice article uh, in, uh, I think it was Biblica, the journal Biblica, by uh, a guy named Proven Kahl on uh, the, the, the seraphim, the fiery serpents. And he goes into the iconography and whatnot. What, what the, the flying description is, is really pointed at is not a dragon. It's not like a, a fang, demonic, bat-winged extraterrestrial or something like that. Okay, so let, let's try to get the cartoons out of our head. What it's aimed at is, if you've, if you've seen like an Egyptian uraeus, you know, the, the, the cobra, the winged cobra, as we you know, modern people like to call it. We know cobras don't fly. We don't know they don't have wings. But what they do have is they have these flaps of skin on their side that expand. Okay, that's what it's talking about. They look like wings. Okay, so these descriptions of flying, fiery serpents are those guys. There are serpents, again, with these sort of wing flaps on the sides of their head that you know extend down their body a little way. And it creates the impression 
and the visual impression that they have wings. That's all it's talking about. And again, these are common. These kinds of serpents are common in the region. They're common in Egypt. They're common in, 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 the, in the Negev, again, because that's where they're walking around here in Numbers 21. And they're poisonous. So God, again, sends a bunch of these, these kind of serpents, cobras, whatever, if you want to use that term, but venomous snakes against the people to punish them. So that's the story. Again, it, 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 it's pretty straightforward, pretty self-explanatory. Now, in response to their repentance, you know, the people, you know, say in verse 7, people come to Moses and say, hey, we've sinned, like no kidding, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Okay, and so in response to their repentance and Moses' intercession, God tells Moses to make a saraf, okay, make a saraf and put it on a pole or a banner. Make, that, that's the term there, you know, at least one of them that's used in here. But then when Moses actually makes it, it's called the Nakash Nekoshet, the bronze serpent. And these two verses here, verses 8 and 9, show us that Saraf and Nakash are being used interchangeably, uh, again, for a, a normal snake. But, of course, when Moses fashions it, he's going to fashion it, fashion it out of bronze and mount it on a pole. Now, here's where you actually start to get into, I think, some worthwhile questions as far as, well, what the story's kind of straightforward. But... What's the meaning of it? Like, what, what's going on? What are they thinking? You know, why is God telling them to do this? And here's where, you, again, in the academic discussion, you get, again, some, some variance of opinion. You know, a, a lot of overlapping, but there is some variance here. Serpents, you know, most scholars will point out, were associated throughout the ancient Near East with healing. And, you know, you ask, well, why? What, what, what is there about a serpent that would, an ancient person would look at it and, associate it with healing, or, okay, I'm going to give you some hints here, or rejuvenation, or even the spontaneous appearance of life, okay, the origin of life, that kind of thing. Why would a person look at a serpent? Why would an ancient person, why would, you know, why would Egyptians, why would Mesopotamians, why would Hittites, why would Canaanites look at serpents and associate them in some way with healing with fertility, the bringing forth of life, and rejuvenation? Well, it's because they shed their skin. It's like they become new. And to the ancient mind, to the ancient eye, it was like a rebirth. It was something, a new thing coming out of the old thing, and the new thing is better than the old thing. It's rejuvenation. It's the origin of life. It's, you know, it, and, and again, this whole healing idea. So this is why uh, ancient people tended to look at serpents this way, and 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 this belief, or this I believe is probably the wrong word, but this this notion, this conception of what was happening to a snake when it shed its skin, uh, is reflected in ancient Near Eastern iconography, and in many places there are many examples. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll just I'm going to give you a, uh, a couple of quotations here. The first one is from DDD Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. And the entry on uh, Nakash, uh, it's either Nakash or, Na or Nakushtan uh, for this entry, says, quote, The use of snake images to affect the cure of venomous snake bites is consistent with the ritual symbolism of snakes in the ancient Near East. In Egypt, snake amulets would be worn by the living or the dead to ward off venomous snakes. The Uraeus serpent, by the way, the dead reference there in, in, in some of the books of the dead, the big enemy, you know, to... to getting into the positive afterlife was Apophis, the serpent. You know? So there's another, you had, you had to wear the, the serpent thing to ward off the other serpent, but you know, let's not rabbit trail too much on that. But the Uraeus serpent protected gods and kings from danger. Again, one of the symbols of the pharaoh. Because of his snake nature, the king was immune to snake venom and could cure others. Again, because he had aligned himself you know, with the, 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 the snake god who was his protector you know, that, that the king was immune to bad snakes, you know, and could, could heal and, you know, all this kind of stuff. This is part of Egyptian religion, a part of Egyptian mythology. Protective snake figurines are also found in Mesopotamia, including reliefs and amulets of two snakes en entwined. Again, you've all seen this symbol, the, the two snakes, you know, going up the pole, wrapping themselves sort of together. The symbol was later inherited in Greek culture as the healing symbol of Asclepius. Okay, we, we, we refer to it as the caduceus, the and you'll still see it, you know, in, in medical insignia uh, today. It's a very old symbol. 
Another quote, this is from Karen Joyne's book, Serpent Symbolism in the Old Testament. This isn't a direct quote. I'm just going to summarize here. She's citing uh, a guy named William Ward who was an expert in uh, Egyptian scarabs. But Joyne's citing Ward notes that the caduceus has been found on Babylonian cylinder seals as well, uh, not just scarabs, but Babylonian cylinder seals from as early as the 4th millennium BC, so into the 3000s BC. In that case, it was probably a fertility symbol, though, and not a healing emblem. Serpents were widely associated with life, that is, the origin or the springing to life, the the rebirth of life, again, because of the things we've talked about. So they were were often fertility symbols, and that's typically what you see in the Mesopotamian context, but you also get healing there, too. So, again, with that as sort of a backdrop, what's going on here with with Moses and the Israelites in, in their context? Now, some have have taken this propensity or this this ancient this this common conception that serpents again were were associated with with healing, and they they look at what's going on in the numbers episode, and to them it really to many scholars it's a it's a fairly clear example of something called sympathetic magic. Now, if, if you're unfamiliar with that term, sympathetic magic is where the cure for a problem is achieved by fashioning a physical object that relates to the problem or looks like the problem or in some way is associated with the problem in order to combat the problem. Uh, you, you could also produce a, uh, a, an object in sympathetic magic that would produce a certain result, again, after some ritual. Now, I, I think the latter, again, this this doing something to, to get a desired physical effect, I think Sympathetic magic, in in that sense, is is almost definitely what's behind the Jacob and Laban story. If you remember um, Genesis thirty, I believe it is, where they're they're laying out rods, you know, or you know, these little, I don't know, for lack of a better term, these these pieces of plants, these stems, these rods, or whatever, before the the sh- you know the sheep, the flocks, you know, to to produce the kind of offspring, you know, that that. Would, would belong to Jacob, the spotted, the speckled, and all that kind of stuff. Now, God tell you know, he does this, but later, you know, Jacob says that he gets, he gets the idea from God, um, you know, to do this, to outwit Laban. And to me, that, that's a very clear example of, of sympathetic magic. And what's going on there is, is God tells him to do this, and Jacob believes God. So, he, you know, th- this kind of thing would have been familiar culturally, Again, because of, you know, you have other people doing this kind of stuff. And so God says, well, here's what you do. Here's what you do to outwit Laban. You make this stuff, you put it in front of the flocks, they'll do the they'll do their breeding thing, and you know, lo and behold, this is what you're gonna get. So Jacob believes that God will do this, and so he responds to this idea, does what he's told to do, and God produces the results. Now, is that what's going on in Numbers 21? Well, you know, if if you read it that way, kind of, you know. God says, hey, make, make this the serpent, put it on a pole. People look at it after they're bitten, they'll be okay. You know, so, so the notion of, of sympathetic magic uh, in and of itself, if you believe the source of the power is the God of Israel, is not a theologically offensive idea to an Israelite. Now, to us, it's really foreign. But again, we don't live in this culture. You know, we, we're, not, we're not dealing with this kind of mode of communication. You know, we we don't have God telling us to do these sorts of things. Again, this is this is God doing something, telling someone to do something that would have sounded familiar, would not have been, you know, completely bizarre in their context. And Jacob or here Moses, God, God told me to do this, and I believe that God's gonna do something with it, so let's do that. Because God is powerful. God is able to do whatever he's gonna do through this means, and I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna I'm gonna make that thing, I'm gonna you know, Jacob, Jacob's instant, I'm going to lay this stuff down in front of the sheep and you know, again, let them, let them breed. And, and I expect that God will produce the result that I'm going to like. And he, and he does. Well, again, it's, it's kind of the same thing with Moses. So I could see, you know, the, the sympathetic magic idea here uh, in, in their context. Milgram has an interesting quote here in, in his numbers commentary. And Milgram is a, is, was a Jewish scholar. I, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he has a very well-known commentary on numbers in the Jewish Publication Society Torah series. He writes, The homeopathic use of snakes is a distinctive feature of ancient Egypt. So, you know, again, that would have been familiar to Moses. 
A serpent-shaped amulet, again, was worn by the living to repel serpents and also by the dead, often mummies, to ward off attacks by serpents and other reptiles in the netherworld. Again, I, I made the mention of Apophis earlier. Thus, at the time of Moses, Milgram writes, the belief prevailed in Egypt that images of serpents would repel serpents as well as heal wounds caused by them. You're using you're using the like thing to combat the other thing. And, and the thing, you know, if you, you know when, when your God tells you to do this against the other thing, you're fashioning the same object. You know, your God, you, you believe, is going to have the power, you know, through that object to combat this evil thing that, that is after you or that's harming you, that's afflicting you. Again, the, so, so the Numbers 21 episode reads very similar to that, very, very much like that. Milgram continues, it is likely no accident that a copper image of a snake was found at Timnah, the copper mining region near a lot on the Red Sea dating from between 1200 to 900 BC. So sort of a contemporary example. Uh, obviously not the one associated with the story. Uh, Baruch Levine comments on this in his numbers commentary, and I think it's important you know, to hear Levine as well. The incident of the bronze serpent is an excellent example of the interaction of prayer with, with magical praxis, magical sort of tactics or, or acts, ritual acts, and in no way assails the power of the God of Israel. On the contrary, it reaffirmed Yahweh's power. The many attempts to explain away the account of this incident on the grounds that, if taken at face value, it would conflict with biblical monotheism, reflect a basic misunderstanding of ancient Near Eastern magical phenomenology as known to us from comparative sources. And again, that's, that's Levine's more flowery way of saying what I said a few minutes ago. When Yahweh tells you to do this, this is not going to be a really... You're not going to look at Yahweh and go like, hey, is there wax in my ears? Can you repeat that again? Because that's just kind of weird. No, they're going to know. Moses is going to be familiar with this idea. Jacob is going to be familiar with the idea. Again, this quote, sympathetic magic, is that's a term modern anthropologists use. But your God is telling you to fashion an object that your God is going to use to heal your wound or to fix your problem or to deal with the evil thing that is troubling you. And so you have to choose to either believe what your God is telling you, to believe that your God is powerful or not. Jacob believed and did it. Moses believed and did it. And Yahweh used their, their obedience, again, they're, they're following the procedures to produce you know, the results he said he would produce. So for an Israelite, this isn't strange. This is, again, something culturally normative, culturally familiar. To us, it looks bizarre. And when you get anthropologists running around saying, oh, this is sympathetic magic, you know, because we're moderns, and again, this isn't our world, you, know, you get a lot of people running around and they'll, they'll, they'll seize that point and say, oh, well, this, boy, this is, you know, you can't have monotheism with this. You can't have a belief in Yahweh. No, it's exactly the opposite. Yahweh is asserting his power over the situation. And, and the spiritual lesson, frankly, in Numbers 21 is the God who caused you judgment, the God who caused you pain and harm and death is the same God who can take it away. He has power over death and power over life. Life and death are in his hands. And so there is, by definition then, if you can fix that in your mind, you'll get, you'll get the, even you know, the, the ancillary point here. By definition, you can't appeal to any other power. God sent the serpents to punish you. The only thing that will take them away is God. The only solution to the problem is Yahweh of Israel. There is no higher authority. There is no alternate source of power that can undo what Yahweh did. Only Yahweh can undo what Yahweh does. And so you are dependent on his goodness to relieve the problem. And this is what he's asking you to do. End of story. So the theological point is very consistent with the elevation of Yahweh, you know, what, what scholars would call biblical monotheism. It's not contrary to it in any regard. But again, you've got a lot of, you know, fruit loops running around on the internet that, that take a story like this. And again, you know, the, the terms that anthropologists use, and they rip it out of context to argue whatever flaky point it is that they want to argue, you know, from the, from the passage. And it's just not legitimate. It's, it's not good scholarship. I think that's probably the, the most succinct way to, to put it. Now, when Jesus, you know, references this, I think the associations are, 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 are quite plain. If you don't have the Genesis 3 serpent floating around in your head, there's no problem. And you shouldn't have the Genesis 3 serpent floating around in your head 
Because again, there's no indication the Israelites had ever even heard the story, and there's no links in Numbers 21 back to Genesis 3. Okay, there's no sense of, of you know, divine evil beings here. They're, they're just snakes. That's what they are. And God, again, provides the solution. But when Jesus says, hey, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that anyone who looked upon it was cured. And that was the power of God that was undoing the problem of death, because they were going to die from the bites if they weren't treated. So God commands Moses to make this, this serpent. God says, I will undo this thing that no one else can undo. No one, no God, no deity, no person can, can deal with. I will deal with it if you build the bronze serpent, lift it up, and tell the people, look at, look at it when you're bit, you will be healed. And Jesus says, that's just like what, just like what God's going to do here. You know, we have this problem that the cross rectifies, and no other thing but the cross can rectify it, this problem of death, this problem of human mortality. So the Son of Man must be lifted up. Okay, again, a, 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 I think a fairly, not a, it's not a totally point-blank reference to the cross, but again, if you know, as you're reading the Gospels, you know what he's talking about here, his own self-sacrifice on the cross. And he's saying, look, this is the solution. You know, look upon it and believe. If, 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 if you don't turn, turn to it in faith and believe, you're going to die. Okay, you will inherit death. So uh, the analogy is, is I think, a, a pretty powerful one. But it's confusing to a lot of people in our day because we have Genesis 3 floating around in our heads and we're wondering, what in the world's going on? Well, nothing's going on. Okay, you don't don't import things, don't throw things into the blender that the Israelites didn't have in the blender and the writer didn't have in the blender. You don't just get to throw other passages in the blender and say, oh, that looks messy now. Well, yeah, it does, because you just messed it up. So again, we need to again be thinking more about the the immediate and the larger context of what what the writer and what the Israelites had in mind. Now I should say one other thing uh, before you know, we wrap up here. The bronze serpent is mentioned in 2 Kings 18. It had, you know, survived, you know, many years. And, and this is the account where it's specifically it's 2 Kings 18, 1 through 6. And it's it's part of the Hezekiah story. So I'll read it here. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of, ah, of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Avi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made for, here's why, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted, he, Hezekiah, trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him, for he held fast to the Lord, so on and so forth. So Hezekiah, again, as part of his campaign against idolatry, destroys the bronze serpent uh, of Moses. Now, that account you know, raises a number of questions. By the way, Nehushtan sounds like both the Hebrew terms for bronze, Nehoshet, and serpent, Nehosh. So again, they, they gave it a name, Nehushtan, uh, again, using it for idolatrous purposes. So the, you know, there are a number of questions. You know, what does until those days mean? D does, does that mean that the serpent was worshipped from the time of Moses onward? Probably not. You know, you, you can't see Moses putting up with that, obviously. Did they worship it from the time of the construction of the temple? In other words, when they actually got a temple in Jerusalem, did they bring this thing in and start to worship it? Well, who knows? From some other period before Hezekiah, probably more likely because, again, the Old Testament tells, tells us the story of you know, Israel's idolatry. But I think maybe a, a more interesting question is, what did the serpent represent in the Israelite cult, the Israelite ritual system? And when was it made part of that system? Again, we, we don't the, the short answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows the answer to any of these questions. It, and it's actually very complicated because it takes you into pre... Do you, do you realize that Jerusalem had to be conquered? Do David conquered Jerusalem and it became his capital city. Okay, before the conquest of, of David, before he took the city, 
It was called, you know, Shalom. You know, uh, it's associated with Melchizedek. You know, look at the name Melchizedek. It's associated with Zadok. You know, in, in the minds of some scholars, remember during David's time, there were essentially two high priests: Zadok, and I'm trying to remember the other one. I'm drawing a blank here, uh, Abiathar. So people have wondered, well, what's going on with that? You know, like, like, you know, why, why do you have two guys instead of one? Is there, it, you know, you can't really tell if either of them are Levitical. You know, and, and so th- there's a really long, convoluted, and here's the key word, speculative background to what's going on in Jerusalem worship before David becomes king. And again, if it's pre-Davidic, it's just going to be sort of kind of traditional Canaanite. And so you have to ask yourself the question, well, you know, after David was there and, you know, David does some good things and some bad things, he gets the idea to build a temple. It's eventually built, you know, by Solomon and the ark is moved in there. But that was pre-Hezekiah. So what, what, what's up with Nehushtan? What's up with this bronze serpent? Like, was that in there with the ark? Did they put it inside the ark? Is it some object that maybe one of the priests liked because maybe it was associated with, you know, religion before David? Because, hey, you know, Israelites, you know, were doing something before David. And they were doing lots of crazy things before David. Look at the period of the judges, people doing what's right in their own eyes. You know, there's a lot of apostasy going on. There's a lot of, you know, intermarrying and interreligious mixture of Israelite thinking and Canaanite thinking. You know, maybe somebody, you know, saw this object, you know, one day it got wherever it was kept. We're not even told where it was kept in Moses' day. But somebody got a hold of it, maybe made it a god out of it, made it the focus of worship. You know, we have no idea what its history was what its history was in relationship to the Ark, what its history was in relationship to the high priesthood, you know, pre and post Jerusalem. We don't know any of it. And, and if you read the material, you're going to get all sorts of speculation, again, about what might be the history of this thing. All we know for sure is what Second Kings tells us. Hezekiah destroyed it because it had become an object of idolatry. We don't know when it did. We don't know how that was marketed to the people, if it even really needed to be marketed. In the days of the good kings, we don't know if it was used or not used. Because to many, and I catch this, to many, this would have been a symbol of Yahweh. Now, that might sound shocking because, hey, isn't there a command about making no graven image? Well, yeah, there is. But God told Moses to make this this bronze serpent, and Moses did, and, and God healed the people. So when this happens, that's going to have an effect on people. It's going to become, a, it's not going to become an ordinary object. And so to the, in the minds of even a good Yahweh worshiper, this was a, I'll, I'll use my, my terminology here carefully, this would have been a special thing. This would have been a special object because this was the thing that, that God told Moses to build in it and it healed people. It's important. I mean, whether, you know, if you're a true worshiper of, of, of Yahweh, you know, you, you worship only Yahweh. So here's the here's here's a question: Would you refuse to do anything that felt like worship when this snake was involved, or would you think, well, that's just a symbol of Yahweh? We know it isn't Yahweh because it, it's not. It was never fashioned. You know, God didn't say, "Hey, make this brazen serpent because it looks like me." You know, this is an image of me. He doesn't say any of that. So it would have been associated with Yahweh, and so maybe even a godly Yahweh worshiper would think, well. You know, there's nothing wrong with having that as part of some festival or ritual or whatever, because it's a symbol of the Lord. You know, who knows? Again, it's all speculation. You know, you have to psychologize the Israelites to, you know, come up with a quote unquote answer, which really isn't an answer because it's it's just a guess. It's speculation of of, of what they were thinking. You know, faithful Israelites and and as opposed to apostate Israelites. You know, because they're not going to care. They're they're just going to they're going to make it a deity, and, and off we go. But not every Israelite's going to be thinking the same thing. And so, what were the, what was going through their minds with this this thing? You know, because people knew it, they saw it. Of course, you know, when you get the temple, the ark's there. You know, is it with the ark or not? I mean, nobody knows. So, like I said, you can do lots of entertaining reading, where scholars will try to tie this into you know, the, the, the Melchizedek priesthood because of Zadok, you know, Zadok, you know, being the pre, catch this, catch, catch the wording here, the pre-Davidic, pre-national Israel, okay, priesthood. And some would argue because 
Malkid Sedek and Zadok are the same consonants, okay? That there, there's, there's a priestly name thing going on here between these two guys. And Zadok was a representative of a priesthood, catch this, that was earlier than Aaron's. That was viewed as, in, in that sense, more everlasting <laughs> or more important than Aaron's. Again, and, and so the, the real high priest is the line of Melchizedek and Zadok. And so one, once you start, again, going down that rabbit trail, then, you know, you get stuff like, like well, where did the serpent show up? And again, nothing textually ties all these things together. But let's make that clear. Nothing textually t- makes, the, makes the connections. But this is the kind of thing you'll read. Now, I do think, again, this is getting real far off the rabbit trail, so I got I to gotta rein myself in here. But I do think that this whole idea of a high priesthood after the order of Melchizedek is obviously legit at Psalm 110. And, and the way you, you get that as a superior priesthood over the line of Aaron is to, here's the harsh word, is to assume, <laughs> is to assume the priesthood of Aaron was a concession to Moses way back in Exodus 4, that he needed help. Or you could read the, here's the nice word, it's not an assumption, you could read the Mosaic account and, and, and see the compassion of God in giving Moses a helper, and his brother becomes the, the high priest. But what God really intended was, since he has Abraham meet up with Melchizedek, was that someday Abraham's descendants would live in this city and have this priesthood, the priest of the Most High God, and that this was God's design all along for the priesthood. And that is why the, Mel- the Melchizedek priesthood is superior and Aaron's priesthood is secondary because God, again, he, he, gives it to, he gives it to Israel because he gave it to Moses. Moses needed a helper. You know, so you, you can read the account that way. You can, you can sort of make it a bit of speculation. I mean, again, we don't ultimately know, but we do know that there was this thing called the, the high priesthood of Melchizedek. Okay, we, we do know that. And there was Zadok, and there was Abiathar, you know, and, and the whole Levitical thing. The, 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 the high priesthood thing is, is really kind of a hornet's nest when it comes to Old Testament theology, because there are lots of ambiguities built into it. And if you do any reading, I'm telling you all that to, to sort of condition you. If you do any reading on Nehushtan, and again, what, what's going on with Hezekiah and why he destroyed it, and how in the world did it become this thing of idolatry, you will invariably run into this whole discussion about Zadok and Melchizedek and the, and the pre-Israelite, the, it's called the Jebusite priesthood, because that was one of, is, one, that was one of Jerusalem's old names, Jebus, okay, the, the Jebusite. It was a Jebusite land possession there. But anyway, that, that's getting you know, quite a bit off the, the beaten path. I'm going to add one more thought. There are some who would also say that the religious role of the serpent might be due and I, I, again, I'm going to tell you up front, I think this one's far-fetched, but, but it, it might entertain somebody here. There were some who would say that the, the, the religious use of the bronze serpent, either during or, or earlier than Hezekiah's time, had something to do with the fact that since serpents were associated with life, that we might have the serpent as being a, a symbol or an artifact of something that modern scholars call the Omphalos myth. And the Omphalos myth, I'll spell it O-M-P-H-A-L-O-S. It's a term that means the navel of the world, the center of the earth, the central point from which terrestrial life springs and originates. Now, think with me. Here, here's, here's how people would defend this idea. They would say, well, Eden... Look at look back at the Garden of Eden, and you're thinking, well, Mike, I thought you said Numbers 21, the bronze serpent has nothing to do with the Garden of Eden. Yes, I did, and I and I do think that. So that's why I think this is far fetched. But follow follow me if you will. And this is how it's defended. You, Mike, you know, the Garden of Eden, that's where life's origin was, and, and there was a tree of life, you know, in the Garden of Eden, and and in in Mesopotamia, the tree of life was associated with the the serpent, because you got this intertwined serpent neck stuff, you know as a symbol of life and Gilgamesh is searching for eternal life and he finds a sacred plant, which, you know, we identify with the tree of life. And he loses that when he loses immortality, when, when, when the, the plant is stolen by a serpent in the, in the Gilgamesh story. 
and and so like Jerusalem is the new Eden, right? You know, Jerusalem is the new Eden, and and so as Eden was the center, the the wellspring of all life, there are people who would have believed that Jerusalem was the wellspring of all life, and the serpent object probably helped remind people or, or teach people that Jerusalem was the new Eden. If I had a cricket sound, I would kind of play it right here. Um, yeah, you'll you'll run into that too. Again, the, the 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 severe problem with this is how it it not only links the discussion back to Genesis three, but it ignores the evil aspect of the serpent in Genesis three, <laughs> which is really convenient and frankly really necessary uh, for that discussion. Now, I, I I will say this: the Omphalos idea that Jerusalem is the center of the world that is biblical. Okay, that is biblical thinking, but it has nothing to do with Numbers 21. It has nothing to do with Nehushtan. It has nothing to do even with Genesis 3. Where you see it, there's a couple passages. Uh, there's two in Ezekiel. I'll read them to you. Uh, Ezekiel 5, 5 says, Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of the nations with countries all around her. And then in Ezekiel 38, 10 to 12, we have another reference here. If you're taking notes, Ezekiel 38, 10, and 12 say this. Thus says the Lord God, on that day, thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil scheme. Again, this is the, the passage about Jerusalem getting invaded by Gog and Magog and you know all that stuff. Gog of Magog. He says, you know, on that day, you will devise an evil scheme and say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. So he's, he's kind of, Ezekiel's kind of mouthing what, what Gog is thinking, you know, the great enemy. I'm going to go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars and gates. Verse 12, to seize spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited. And the people who were gathered from the nations, which isn't that a real interesting line, the people who were gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell at the center of the earth. Okay. So it's this idea that Jerusalem was, was sort of the center of all things, the center of the earth. So that, that idea, again, is, is part of biblical thinking. And it, it's because this is Yahweh's place. Yahweh is the source of life. La, Yahweh is the, is the source from which all life springs. Everything, again, to, to work the metaphor, everything revolves around him and where he is. And that was Zion. That was Jerusalem. So, so this idea is part of biblical thinking and part of biblical theology, but it has nothing to do with Nehushtan, the brazen serpent, and all this sort of stuff. So to wind up, I think Numbers 21 makes sense just as it is. It makes sense at face value. It wasn't connected to Genesis 3 at all. And the mosaic that, you know, you have a mosaic Yahweh symbol wind, it, it, that, that winds up getting perverted into idolatry. Oh, well. Okay, the Israelites turned the whole system into an idolatrous system. You know, wh why, would, why would we be shocked that an object that in Moses' day would have been associated with the power of Yahweh, why would be, we be shocked that that, that gets used later on for idolatry and Hezekiah has to destroy it? I don't find it shocking at all. Given what we, what we read in the Old Testament about the Israelites, basically they're prone to do almost anything with almost anything in, in terms of idolatry. So again, I, I think these are these passages are pretty easily understandable in their own terms. The other theorized elements are interesting, but they're ultimately only speculation. Mike, what's your thoughts on Genesis 6-4, the men of renown, with the Greek gods, the god of healing? What is what is his name? Asclepius. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, I, I don't I don't think that there's Again, it's it's going to be serpentine stuff, and I don't I don't see any connection there with Genesis well, six four. Well, I'm just saying, you know, he's the god of healing who symbolizes a brass serpent on a pole, and you got Hermes with the the two serpents uh, intertwined on a staff. I mean, is there any connections there with of this language? No, not in terms of the language. I mean, every every I, I think I've mentioned this before on on an episode, but if you're interested in how Greek material. Uh, was influenced by and repurposes ancient Near Eastern material, you know, like the Mesopotamian stuff here. 
the best book to read is is called The East Face of the Helicon. It's by M. L. West. It's it's a bit hard to find. Uh, I think it's out of print unless unless they brought it back into print now. And it's also a little pricey. But there's nothing else like it. Um, so you you do have connections between Greek Greek stories, Greek myths, Greek characters, Greek deities, and and quasi deities and ancient Near Eastern material. And since there's a connection between ancient Near Eastern material and biblical material, because we have a more of a chronological overlap there and a and a geographical overlap there. You're you're going to you're you're going to see reflections in all three. In, in other words, you're, you're going to you're going to see commonalities between all three. But what what you can't you you, you can't really say that the, the biblical stuff is based on the Greek again because that there's a cr- chronological problem with that. You're going to have to you're going to have to see the Greek material sort of responding to and interacting with and repurposing the same kind of stuff that the biblical writers are bouncing off of. But the biblical writers are doing it for altogether different reasons. They're doing it for polemic reasons, uh, rather instead of just you know, hey, I I I, I like this story and I'm, I'm going to use this to tell a story over here, as opposed to making a theological point. So there there is there is some difference in strategy as to why writers would do what they do. But again, the, the stories you know do do get reflect you know you get these common reflections of. Of each of them, and the, the the Titan story in Greek. There's actually two versions in, in Greek, ancient Greek literature of the Titan story that that are not free of contradiction. Um, and a lot of people who talk about the Titans don't realize that that they're they're actually two different stories. But one of them again is very close to the to the elements of Genesis six, and the the other one isn't so close. But you know, you you have retelling in. in, in you know, on those terms as well about, well, what happened before the flood? What happened after the flood? Because there is this flood thing going on, you know, in, in most of the ancient, ancient Near Eastern and Aegean world. And so you have, you have sort of common touch points with those too, with, with those events. Well, we need to switch gears here. And uh, as everybody probably noticed, uh, the new website's up. So yep. <laughs> you know, I just want to remind everybody, it's still a work in progress. So, but it's still cool. I mean, even, even if it's a work in progress, it's a big improvement. I like it. It's awesome. I think Joe did an awesome job on the website and uh, the new images. And uh, he's doing the majority of the lifting, the heavy lifting. And then I will probably be bringing the podcast into drmsh.com at some point and uh, doing some tweaks here and there. So just want to give Joe and his team a big thanks for all the yeah. work that they've done. Yeah, a lot of work. Absolutely. All right, Mike. Well, we did an episode on how the development of the New Testament uh, came about. So next week, we're going to tackle the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about where we got the Old Testament. Um, there are, there is conspiracy talk associated with that. We'll get into that a little bit. It's it's not as familiar as the uh, King James only stuff, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll try to do something a little weird, <laughs> you know, with that one. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, it's only it's only fair that uh, three quarters of your Bible, the Old Testament, gets equal time. Okay, again, just want to thank Joe and his team for the uh, all the work they've done, and thank everybody for your patience with that and for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.